little brother slugged his old wife. All those who should have walked together. And he's gone to bed at 10 o'clock at night. What's the face? Um, so we're talking about activation energy, and we're talking about ways that we can meet activation as energy. And when we do this, when we meet the activation of energy, the energy of activation rather, we can cause a spontaneous, favorable reaction to occur at a relatively high rate. And we have two ways in biology that we could potentially meet the energy of activation. And really, only one of the ways is going to be good. So only one option is really all that advantageous for a biological system. The way that's not too advantageous is to just simply add heat. And we briefly spoke about this before. So can someone tell me what would happen to the chemical reactions in the human body if we just increase heat? In what? Okay, they would they would meet their energy of activation all simultaneously. So every chemical reaction that you have that is a possibility would end up going. And that wouldn't be very advantageous because if we don't need ATP, we don't want to produce ATP. We don't need proteins to be synthesized, we don't want to synthesize proteins. So just by adding heat, we would end up with a global response. All reactions occur, and so we do some things that are energetically unfavorable. We would also do some things that are just simply life threatening, like we begin to break product again, and we begin to lose our ability to produce all of the things that we need to survive. The other way, which is far more advantageous, is to add an enzyme. And if we add an enzyme, there's going to be one enzyme for each specific chemical reaction that occurs in a biological system. And so using enzymes rather than heat makes the response very specific. So now we have the ability to control specific reactions at specific times. So how exactly does an enzyme work, and how does it achieve a reasonable energy of activation? And it comes down to the interaction between the enzyme and the specific substrate that it's going to act upon. Basically, the specific reactant that we're going to convert into product. In the model that we use here it, it to, to represent enzyme chemistry is called the induced fit model. And really what this is, is when the enzyme attaches to the substrate, the substrate actually induces a conformational change in the enzyme that allows the enzyme to function. So in this in model of the induced fit, the substrate binds at the active site. So again, what kind of molecule are the enzymes? Are they carbohydrates? They're proteins. And what happens when we bind something to a protein? Yeah, so we're going to change the shape which leads into a change in the function of all the change in the physiology. So with nothing bound up at the active site, the enzyme is just basically inactive. Then we have our substrate. In this case, the enzyme is called sucrase. The substrate is called sucrose. It's glucose and fructose. Sucrase is going to break that bond between the glucose and the fructose to form the glucose molecule and the fructose molecule. High enough concentrations of sucrose will cause increases in interaction with this enzyme sucrose. That interaction forms 
and this induces the fit. This creates the active form of that enzyme that's going to catalyze the reaction when that sucrose molecule binds at the active site. Okay? So it's a protein. Proteins, uh, they function to create physiological response. The enzyme, from an anatomical perspective, is going to have the active site just simply put, this is where the reaction is going to occur. There could be some other sites as well. We'll talk a little bit about those. They don't tell us there are sites and regulation sites where they find something else that changes the functionality of that of that enzyme. Okay, uh, but we'll get there in just a just a second. Just looking ahead here, just a little bit. So the substrate binds the active site, and when the substrate binds the active site, the enzyme is caused to go through a conformational change. The proteins shape changes. So the substrates, <clears throat> it's said, uh, induce the final enzyme form. <clears throat> Again, that's called the induced fit model. Now, when the substrate binds and we form this complex between the enzyme and its substrate, enzyme changes just a little bit. That change, the induced fit, is what's going to lead towards the chemical reaction occurring. So in some cases, when the substrate or the substrate is brought into the active site, Parts of the substrate are brought close together. Now remember, enzyme is being used to reduce the activation of energy. And if I go back just one slide here, in an uncatalyzed reaction, I have a high amount of energy for activation. And I can meet that, I can just increase the heat put in more energy, heat energy, and that can cause the reaction to go. In the case of the uh, enzyme catalyzed reaction, we're actually reducing the activation energy. That energy of activation is reduced. And the way that that's done is we actually bring the parts of the substrate close together. And when we bring them close together, that favorable reaction that occurs spontaneously but not at a very high rate is now going to occur with a very small amount of energy of activation required. So you can kind of think of this as I'm taking, in the case of sucrase, that sucrose molecule has a glycosidic linkage. It's a 1-6, one, 1-4 uh, one one rather, I'm sorry, 1-4 glycosidic linkage. That's a covalent bond, and really what we're looking at there is we're sharing the electrons across that bond. Now I bring water in in the right conformational, in the right locational position. So basically I now have that water molecule so that it's really close to where those electrons are, and that favors the interaction between those electrons in the water and the electrons in the sucrose. And we undergo this exchange of those electrons, the electrons now are shared in different locations. Pop a hydrogen onto the glucose, a hydroxyl group onto the fructose. They no longer are bound together. They get spit out of the enzyme as individual molecules. Okay? So literally, um, you know, if I want to shake Devante's hand, I'm not going to be able to do it here. i got to bring it close together before we're actually going to be able to make that interaction. So the water molecule has to be put into the right position in reference to the substrate in order for that interaction to happen. And by doing that, we see that we don't need as much energy for that favorable reaction to actually begin to occur. Does that make sense? So the enzyme is just simply the place that takes all of the parts of the reaction and puts them into the right orientation so that that chemical reaction will actually occur under the, uh, the temperature that we find in, uh, within the organism, in humans uh, would be body temperature. 
And so the parts of the substrate or parts of the substrates are brought close together, and when they're <coughs> brought close together, that reaction is now going to be able to occur. You actually don't see the water here in reference to the enzyme, but you can see that water does come in. So we know that water comes in, and it's actually going to probably also bind pretty close to that active site, near where that physical location of that glycosidic linkage, so we can exchange the electrons, break the water, break the, um, the sucrose molecule into glucose. Into glucose. So really, this idea that the substrate, when it binds the active site, both the water and then also the sucrose, they bind up, that causes the enzyme, the protein, to go through a conformational change. It shape, changes its shape, just like if I try to catch a baseball with my mitt, I gotta have my mitt open. And then when the ball lands in the mitt, the glove has to snap shut in order for it to, uh, to catch the ball. When it's open, I can't catch the ball. When the ball hits that open pocket of the mitt and it causes it to close, that's like a conformational change. I'm changing the shape of the glove in order to hold the ball. Before, I couldn't hold the ball when my glove was open, right? So I didn't have the right shape. Then the ball interacts. It's just like the substrate binding the enzyme, closes up the glove, I've changed the conformation of, uh, of the enzyme or the baseball mitt, and I've changed the function. I now can hold the ball, whereas before I could not. Enzyme gets bound by the substrate in the water, it changes the shape of the enzyme, the reaction now can occur. This idea of the catalytic cycle is basically how we describe the whole thing. So this part is the induced fit. Putting on the substrate causes the change in the enzyme to allow the rest of the reaction to occur. The rest of the reaction is modeled here as the catalytic cycle. So induced fit model is just simply substrates binding chain and shape of the enzyme. Catalytic cycle is the rest of what happens to cause that reaction to occur. The catalytic cycle starts out with the substrate and the enzyme in a free or unbound state. Okay, so you got the substrate that's free, and then you have that enzyme that's free. By the way, how does this interaction occur to go from the free unbound form of the substrate and the enzyme to form what's coming next, which is going to be our enzyme substrate complex? How does that actually occur? It's all based off of Brownian motion. Both of these things are randomly moving around within the context of the system. Random movement, if there's enough substrate and enough enzyme present, they're eventually going to bump into each other. As you increase concentration, you have more of those interactions that become possible. Right? It's like kind of like being on the subway. Any of you have been up to New York on subway like at 3 o'clock in the morning? You go down on the platform and you're the only person there and you're not going to bump into anybody. You go down at like 6.30 in the morning or rush hour and there's millions of people down on the platform and you're bumping into people just because you've increased the concentration of people inside of that given space. So if we increase the substrate, it's more likely that it'll interact with the enzyme just because of the increase in concentration. Even though the process is still random, it's still random movement of those molecules. The more of those molecules that are present, the more likely they are to bump into each other. What's the concentration? <laughs> Just sheer number of more of those molecules. The concentration would be the number of those molecules in the system. So let's say that I have to do something where I'm, I'm converting. Well, let's go back. I'm going to convert sucrose into glucose and fructose. If I have just one sucrose molecule inside of my cell, which is a low concentration, what is the probability that it's going to interact with that sucrose enzyme? Really, really low. Now what if I have a billion sucrose molecules inside of that same space? Now the probability that they're going to bump into each other becomes much more probable. Okay, so the catalytic cycle. You have random movement 
you have this interaction that occurs where the substrate lines up just right with the active site of the enzyme and we form what's called the enzyme substrate complex. So this occurs in the catalytic cycle, the cycle when the substrate binds the enzyme. And we call this the enzyme substrate complex. And this is where that induced fit model is going to occur. This is where that, that induced fit model is going is to feed into, uh, into the catalytic cycle. Because when those substrates bind the active site of the enzyme, they induce the final form of the enzyme. So this is our induced fit. So it's part of the catalytic cycle. But the rest of this is going to just simply be the catalytic cycle, which is going to be the process of actually going through, causing the reaction to occur, and then to release the reactants back into the cell. So when we induce the fit of the enzyme and we get that final computational form, this is what chemically results in our activation energy being reduced. So energy of activation is reduced in this catalyzed reaction. And when we reduce that energy of activation, it becomes favorable for a chemical reaction to occur. Now, when I say a chemical reaction occurs, it's going to occur in multiple different ways for all of our different types of enzymes. So there are different ways in which the energy of activation is decreased in order for the chemical reaction to occur. And I'm just going to give you a couple examples. One thing that may happen is when we get that induced fit, that enzyme actually stretches the covalent bond that we're going to break. And so as it stretches it, we loosen or weaken that bond. The electrons are now being shared across an even larger physical space. And so when we, when we stretch that bond, it becomes more favorable for those electrons to go elsewhere to a, 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 a new bond that's not going to be as stretched. So we could just physically stretch the bond. Or we could take that enzyme and it could fit into its final conformational form, and the bond could be extended into amino acids that are acidic. And so we're going to put them into an acidic pocket within the protein. So we could weaken the bond with acidic amino acids. Acid, amino acids that give up a hydrogen. And that hydrogen increases hydrogen concentration and causes an interaction between that hydrogen and that particular molecule. And so we can exchange the electrons because we move them from, let's say, glycosidic linkage to now attaching them to the hydrogen instead of the other molecule. Another thing that that's supposed to be a two. One, three, one, two, three. Another thing that may happen is the covalent bond that exists between the substrate may be briefly dissociated and then formed between the enzyme and the substrate. So we may take that covalent bond and it breaks because it forms with the enzyme and then the reactant is formed as the enzyme releases that, uh, that covalent bond. So those are the ways that the reaction could occur. And again, we're using this to catalyze or speed up the reaction. It's already usually a favorable reaction. If it's not, then we just have to um, use the energy here, couple a unfavorable reaction to a favorable reaction. Both still require enzymes. We lower the activation of energy uh, required for the reaction to go. We speed the reaction up. And then we end up with substrate. 
um, it could be converted into products. Once we have the product form, we're going to then release the product. And that's going to be the end of the catalytic cycle. Once the products are released, we move back to the beginning of the catalytic cycle. We now have that free unbound enzyme that can rebind such and cause another reaction to occur. So once the products are released, we're back to the beginning of the cycle and we can let it go over and over and over and over again. Now one thing to note is a major rule, and I mean, I guess I don't know exactly what the number would be, but it's probably over 99% of all enzymes are going to finish up their chemical reaction and they're going to go back to their original unbound state, unchanged. Normally, we do not change the enzyme when we go through a chemical reaction. So that chemical reaction occurs and the enzyme comes out the other side of the catalytic cycle just like it was when we knew the catalytic cycle. There are a few examples of enzymes now that we know about where the enzyme undergoes a uh, chemical reaction and it does not revert back to its original form. Those are called suicide enzymes. They get used one time and then they're done. Whereas an enzyme, most of them normally they can catalyze millions of reactions before they get worn out as a protein to have to go through the cycle process and rebuild. So enzyme efficiency is going to be um, as characteristic on uh, how well the enzyme works. Um, so how many reactions in a unit of time can a typical enzyme produce? Is it going to be thousands of reactions in a second, millions of reactions in a second, or just a couple reactions in a second? We can actually modify enzyme efficiency, and we can make enzymes a little more efficient or a little less efficient. And sometimes it's really valuable to do that. I may want to make enzymes that convert a product or a reactant into a product, I'm going to want to make them less efficient if I don't need the product. Right? So let's say that I want to convert glucose into glucose 6-phosphate, which is the first step in the molecular pathway. If I don't need glucose 6-phosphate, if I have really high levels of glucose 6-phosphate, I probably want to turn off that enzyme. And I can actually turn that enzyme off. And there are two ways, two main ways we can turn an enzyme off. We can turn, up, turn them off biologically, or we can turn them off chemically. <laughs> One way that we can adjust the enzyme efficiency chemically is through changes in pH. So if I increase or decrease the pH, become more acidic or alkaline. Um, for humans, we roughly live right around a pH of 6, slightly acidic. If I can alter the pH and make it even more acidic, I can cause the protein that is the enzyme to not function as well. And the reason that is is because we begin to denature the protein. The protein begins to fall out of its normal conformation. I lose my acrocyte or my acrocyte becomes uh, less productive. We can also modify the temperature. How many of you love having a fever? If you have a fever and you feel pretty cruddy, the reason that you feel so cruddy is because we've increased the temperature and this reduces the efficiency of your enzymes. So the enzymes that the cells are needing to produce the energy and all that kind of stuff no longer function as well as they should because of the increase in that temperature. And this results in a decrease in that enzyme's ability to catalyze its reaction. So those would be some chemical examples. How can we change from a biological perspective? We can also use what are called cofactors or coenzymes. Cofactors and coenzymes 
they have the ability to bind to what are called regulatory sites or ancillary sites, some other place outside of the active site of the enzyme. So they bind some other location, and when they bind, they can change the function. They may increase or decrease the function. So these coenzymes or these cofactors, when they bind, they may actually open up the active site. If they're not bound, the active site may actually be closed and prevent the substrate from binding. So it's kind of like turning on the switch. It's like kind of walking up to the regulatory site to do the switch. The cofactor would be the individual how to put that switch on, increase the efficiency and productivity of that particular enzyme. So what actually are the cofactors and the coenzymes? A lot of them are competitive. And some of them can be inhibited substances. Um, the competitive inhibitors are going to be molecules that will bind with the active site. So substrate can bind the active site, competitive inhibitor can bind the active site, and the two of these molecules compete for that active site. The more competitive inhibitors, the higher concentration, the more likely that the competitive inhibitor is going to wind up at the uh, active site and it's going to block the function of that enzyme. And that's why we call it an inhibitor, because it prevents the function of the enzyme. So a competitive inhibitor is simply going to compete for the active site. But we also can have non-competitive inhibitors. In the case of a non-competitive inhibitor, here's a competitive, over here's a non-competitive. So we're going to bind a regulatory site. So this particular cofactor is binding at the regulatory site. So it binds this regulatory site or alternate site. And when it does, every time we bind a protein with something, we change its shape, which leads to a change in its function. So the non-competitive inhibitor is going to change the enzyme. It's going to change the enzyme shape, resulting in an decrease in enzyme function. Now, you actually have already done a lab. We looked at amylase, which is the enzyme that uh, catalyzes the breakdown of structure for amylose. And you used um, PTU, phenolthiothiourea, and you gave uh, you gave the PTU to your system. Does anyone remember what happened when you put the PTU in? The starch pit. Okay, so the starch, the starch was not binding, so we didn't see an increase in glucose, right? And we can measure glucose with that tracer. Uh, we can measure the starch with the iodine solution. What happened if you increased the amount of starch that you put in? Did anything happen? Okay, so what does that mean? With increasing starch, you didn't see an increase in the function of the enzyme. So PTU, is it going to be competitive or not competitive? It's actually non-competitive. The reason it's non-competitive is because it's not competing for that active site. If I have more of that substrate available for a competitive inhibitor, it outcompetes that competitive inhibitor and takes over the, the active site on a much higher frequency when you have higher concentration. Whereas here, it didn't matter how much you put in, as long as that competitive, non-competitive inhibitor bound up the enzyme, the active site was not available. So it didn't matter how much starch was present. It's not knocking 
that non-competitive inhibitor off. So the function continues to remain low. All right, the last thing, um, this is going to be the last stuff that we have for the, for the upcoming exam next Wednesday. A um, couple more notes here, uh, and, and then we'll, we'll have all the material that you need. Um, the last kind of section here that I want to talk through is going to be what's called uh, allosteric regulation. And allosteric regulation is basically this idea that puts the competitive and the non-competitive inhibitors into the regulatory into the regulatory state. So we have competitive and non-competitive inhibitors, cofactors, and coenzymes, and these all can bind up to the enzyme in various locations, including the active site, and they can modify the function of that enzyme. This idea of allosteric regulation is the model that we try to use to understand these regulatory processes. And really, when we look at it, mostly enzymes have two different forms. They have an active form and they have an inactive form. So we have two conformations. Active and inactive. Active obviously means that the reaction is going to occur. Inactive means that the reaction is not going to occur. So if we want reactions to occur, we have to have the enzyme in its active form. And we can regulate the active to inactive, in fact, we can regulate that enzymatic switch through these things called allosteric sites, regulatory sites. And when we bind an enzyme at an allosteric site, and not all enzymes, by the way, follow the allosteric model, but many of them follow the allosteric model. And so when we bind an enzyme at an allosteric site, it causes a change to occur in, uh, in the enzyme. The, the active site will open up, or the active site becomes more accessible so that that enzyme can undergo that chemical reaction. <laughs> when I teach in that, because it happened in your class. We're teaching female reproductive system. I have a female reproductive slide up there. Sold it right there. All the guys were like, this is where I'm coming to school. <laughs> and I am taking that class. <laughs> All right, so basically, allosterics is this idea that when we bind something to an allosteric or regulatory site, we make it possible for the interaction to occur. Now, there's two ways, or two different forms of allosteric regulation. Does that say where it's bound? Does that say confirmed? Com Confirmation switch. So these two forms of allosteric regulation, one of them is going to be an inhibitory process, which is called feed, feedback inhibition. And we've already briefly talked about feedback loops. So we're basically going to, going to utilize a feedback loop. And then we have a, something that's more cooperative that basically enhances the ability of the enzyme. So our feedback inhibition, which is what you can see here, we have a metabolic pathway. And this is basically a series of chemical reactions that allows us to convert one product into another, I'm sorry, one reactant into a product that acts as a reactant for the next chemical reaction. We just move along, right? 
So if we want to take 3 and E, and we want to convert it into isoleucine, so basically this is a ability for us to modify different amino acids and do other amino acids. And we go through a series of steps where we have intermediates. So we have the threonine, which is the original reactant, becomes a product that acts as a second reactant to become a second product, so on and so forth, until we get down to isoleucine. Okay? So what if I have a whole bunch of isoleucine in the cell? I probably don't need more, right? I don't want to continually producing isoleucine, so I don't want threonine to be pulled through this process. If I'm running low on threonine, I don't want to lose all my threonine just to convert it into isoleucine. So what will happen is sometimes it will be one of these intermediate products or it will be the end product itself acts on that first enzyme, which in this case is threonine deaminase. And it will bind up onto that enzyme at what we call the allosteric site. So as the isoleucine levels increase, the concentration of isoleucine increases inside of the cell, we have more interactions with this threonine deaminase enzyme. Binds on and it changes the active site. So isoleucine, no, I'm sorry, threonine can no longer bind. So the isoleucine itself is actually going to be the allosteric inhibitor to reduce the production of itself. We have enough isoleucine, we don't want to produce more. So that's a feedback, feedback inhibition. We're basically using a product that we're producing in our chemical reaction to inhibit that enzyme, which results in inhibition of that enzymatic path. We're going to get into the glycolytic pathway. There are 10 chemical reactions in the glycolytic pathway. There is one reaction uh, where we convert uh, fructose one six bis or I'm sorry fructose one phosphate into fructose one six bisphosphate, and it's done through an enzyme called phosphofructokinase one. Phosphofructokinase one is actually going to bind up ATP, which is the end product of the glycolytic pathway and the end product of um, the electron transport chain. If we have super high levels of ATP, we don't need to convert any more glucose into ATP. And so that ATP feeds back onto the phosphofructokinase 1. There's an allosteric site on PFK that reduces. Sorry, it's like, it's like, it's like, it's like, it's like, so it will reduce the function of PFK to cause no more ATP to be produced and we already have high levels of ATP inside of the cell. So we just simply inhibit that function of that particular pathway. It's basically a way for us to switch that reaction pathway off. So that's our feedback inhibition. Our second type is a cooperativity. allosteric um, regulation modality. And enzymes, they don't always just have a single active site. They may have multiple active sites. In those cases where we have two or more active sites, we may have the inactive form that with high enough levels of the substrate will bind one of the substrates. And when it binds that substrate, all of the other active sites, so you can see there are three other active sites, they get produced or they form their, their correct active site for the chemical reaction. So we bring in one substrate at high enough levels and it causes all of the other active sites to become active so that they can convert product into reactive. So again, kind of an induced fit model here. That first substrate induces the fit of the enzyme, opening up the active sites for all of the other locations on that enzyme. And this allows more binding and activity reactions at those other sites, increasing the productivity of product for reactive. Thank you.
All right, you have everything you need now for the next exam. So, for the first substrate on active sites, the other active sites are active sites. They are inactive active sites. They're just closed down. Um, yeah, it would be kind of like if I'm going to catch a ball. If I have a ball that lands in this hand, it opens up this hand so I can catch more balls. So it's, it's, I mean, it's that news fit um, where that substrate induces the final form, and the final form is to open up all the rest of the back sites on the enzyme. Just turn it off. We're not done yet. No, you have everything that you need for the next exam. We're going to continue on to chapter 9 now. Chapter 9 material. Yep, chapter 9. Oh, you thought we were done? Yeah. We're going to make it happen, Olivia. We're going to use that 3% so wisely. It's working. All right, so now that we have this background in thermodynamics, and we have the background in, in regulating uh, chemical reactions inside of the cell, and we basically know how to do that. Those are the rules. Those are the rules for things like cellular respiration, which is taking glucose and converting it into ATP. Glucose, uh, I'm sorry, um, cellular respiration goes to the glycolytic pathway, the Krebs cycle, and then the electron transfer chain inside of a cell. Um, it's, the, those rules are going to apply for beta oxidation, which is using um, fatty acids as a acetyl CoA, uh, a provider of acetyl CoA to go into the Krebs cycle that then goes to the electron transfer chain to produce ATP. One of the biggest things that we do in the cell is to produce ATP because that's our energy currency inside of the cell. ATP is what we buy every other chemical reaction. So we need a heavy supply of ATP. Uh, but we're also going to have a bunch of other biochemical pathways that are going uh, to occur inside the cell as well. We're going to want to produce proteins because we need to replace enzymes. We need to put in new channels in our membrane. If we're weightlifting, we need to increase uh, the protein concentration in our muscle cells so that we can form more weight and we can adapt to the stresses that we're putting on the organism. Uh, so if you want to call this lecture, this next lecture, something you can call it cellular respiration and fermentation. So we're going to begin to look at our first provisional cycles inside of biological systems. How do we actually get energy needs and energy demands covered that we need for life to continue? So really what this comes down to is these provisional cycles are designed to act in energy harvests, uh, as energy harvesting cycles and, 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 uh, and pathways. So if I take a bunch of catabolic reactions and I put them together one right after the other where the reactants become substrates in the first reaction, the substrates become the reactants of the second reaction, that's called a pathway. And in biology, everything is about pathways. So someone remind me what catabolic means. What's that? Yeah, breaking down. It's going to be the opposite of anabolic. You take anabolic steroids to build muscle. Catabolic processes are going to be the breakdown of chemical energy so that we can convert it into ATP. So in a catabolic pathway, the general flow is going to be to go from more complex molecules that have a much higher potential energy. So why would more complex molecules have a higher potential energy? 
And I'll give you an example of a complex molecule, glucose, which is C6H12 O6. So why is there more potential energy in that molecule? I have more chemical bonds, more electrons shared in uh, a variety of different energy shells. And so we have a lot of potential energy held up inside of that molecule. And cat catabolic pathways are going to take those complex molecules like glucose, and they're going to begin to reorganize their bonds to redistribute electrons into new energy shells. The difference in energy shells from one reactant to its product is its free energy that we can now have available a little bit for heat and a little bit to do functional work, right? Is this all making some sense? Do you kind of get where we're going? You all want to just take a nap? You're at one percent. Okay, so we're going to go from complex to simple. Only three minutes, we'll do it. We're going to go from complex to simple. Complex being a high potential energy holding molecule, towards simple being a much lower potential energy molecule. And as we go through this process of complex to simple. We're harvesting the energy. In other words, we are taking that energy and we are liberating it. We are allowing that free energy to become free energy. It goes from being stored energy to kinetic energy, back into a new form of stored energy. The difference in the two potential energies or two amounts of stored energy will be energy that was liberated. Some lost its heat, but some available to do useful work inside of the cell. The metabolic pathways, the catabolic, catabolic pathways that we're going to utilize to make this process possible are called cellular respiration. which is going to be a series of reactions. There's actually going to be 18 reactions and then something called the electron transport chain, where we take glucose and we interact it with oxygen over these 18 different pathways. Eventually, glucose exchanges its electrons with oxygen through a series of intermediates, and we generate ATP molecules. So cellular respiration, think oxygen is going to be required. The other uh, catabolic pathway is fermentation. In terms of fermentation, this is going to be no oxygen. So if we don't have oxygen or we don't have enough oxygen, we can still produce the energy, the ATP that we need to survive and continue to produce life through a process called fermentation. And in reality, cellular respiration and fermentation both begin the same way. They both go through the, cat the uh, catabolic pathway known as the, gly the glycolytic pathway. So we go through glycolysis. We convert glucose through 10 reactions into a molecule called pyruvate. If we have oxygen, we continue pyruvate into acetyl-CoA into the Krebs cycle, eventually leading to the oxygen. If we don't have oxygen, that pyruvate gets shipped over to either lactate for eukaryotic organisms and mammalian organisms like us to continue to generate ATP, or to ethanol, alcohol, or um, certain yeasts and bacteria for them to be able to continue to produce energy in the, uh, when they, if there's a lack of oxygen. So basically, this is the picture that we're going to begin to really begin to put a lot more detail in. We'll talk about the 10 reactions in the glycolytic pathway. Once we get to pyruvate, we'll talk about going to ethanol and going to lactate if no oxygen is present. We'll talk about going to acetyl-CoA if oxygen is present. Going to the mitochondria to this thing called the citric acid cycle, the Krebs cycle, the tricarboxylic acid cycle, all different names for the exact same thing. Eight reactions there. And the big thing here is we're going to be producing molecules that hold electrons, that shuttle electrons to another area of the mitochondria that holds uh, enzymes that are involved in what's called the electron transport chain. Did you run out of battery? We did it. Sure